So um, I wear two hats today, as Philip said. The first is I'm the chief executive of an organization called the Institute for Sustainability. So we're a small charity based in London. We're 20, 25 people. We have turnover of about uh, uh, $8 million uh, a year. And I'll, I'll touch on that um, relatively briefly just to sort of explain why we exist and sort of who we are. Because I think that has, um, has some... Uh, struck a chord with a, a few people that I've been talking to in, in New Zealand, I guess both when um, some of the people here came across to visit to London and uh, since I've been back here as well. The second hat is the climate kick, um, uh, which is, a, as Philip has said, is a, a European Commission um, organised um, uh, institute which has been set up to drive climate change innovation, looking to bring cl uh, climate change innovation to market. So I will talk about that. Now, the reason uh, I, I have a week uh, in New Zealand and the primary reason that I'm here is to try and create some tangible links between those doing good stuff in sustainable cities, sustainable communities in New Zealand with those doing the same in the UK and Europe. So I am keen to have um, a, a dialogue and a, and a discussion if we can. I'm not sure how easy that's going to be in this format, but we can see what we can do. I have a number of meetings. I spent two days in Christchurch I have yesterday and today in Wellington and tomorrow in Auckland, all with the intention of let's try and create some, some bridges, some links, because I think anybody who's active in, in the world of sustainability will, um, will tell you it can often be a, a, lonely, a lonely thing. Sometimes you feel like you're up against a, a hundred challenges and, and sometimes you just need a friend. And actually there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of friends and I guess you don't have to look too far before you, you, you find actually across the world there are you know, um, thousands and millions of people who really get the agenda and are doing really good things. And so, as I said, I'm primarily interested in connecting those who are doing good things in this part of the world with those who are doing good things in the UK and Europe. So... Um, start with the Institute for Sustainability. So we were set up in 2009 um, and we were set up because it was a, a group of organizations um, from big business, uh, chief scientists, government departments, city governments, regional development agencies, um, academic institutions and some third sector organizations had all come together in a, in a range of um, meetings and workshops focused around the question of why are we not making as much progress in delivering sustainable cities as we should. And this was 2006, I guess, was the first time we had a first conversation. Some of this actually was driven by work that was happening in China and the desire, the Chinese had expressed a desire for eco-cities, and so some of that came back to the UK, and, and that, that led from a Chinese conversation into a, well, why aren't we doing more in the UK and globally? And then and by the time we got to 2009, the, the group... Uh, that had been you know, looking at this and trying to figure out what, what should we be doing had reached the conclusion that one of the big reasons that we weren't um, making the kind of progress we should be was because the, the solutions we need are systemic solutions or, or integrated solutions. We need to move away from thinking about how communities and cities work in silos and think about the interrelationship between different parts of the city. So whether it be, I mean, you can, you can think about systemic solutions in a, in a building and, and think about the whole building and all the different components of a building, you can do the same thing at a city as well. Now, the challenge with this, these thinking about things in a joined up way, these systemic solutions, is that you re require lots of people, lots of stakeholders, lots of people who have a say, whether they have an ownership, uh, they, they own assets or they have responsibility for budgets or they have responsibility for regulation and, and policy or whether... It's just uh, we're a user um, at, at the end of the food chain, maybe, or at the front of the food chain with some of this stuff as well. The, so the complexity of the governance and the structures and the stakeholders uh, led to us setting up the Institute for Sustainability. So we were set up as an independent uh, platform to support uh, organizations that are looking to deliver um, integrated or systemic solutions for sustainable, uh, sustainable cities and sustainable communities. So it was important when we spent a reasonable amount of time thinking about the legal structure, so we said we should be a charity, um, but actually we want to be focused on real-world applications. So our, our governance structure is set up so that our board has to be um, a minimum of 50% made up from the private sector and the rest is made up from academia and uh, public and third sector. So 
my board includes um, uh, people from, uh, well, the gentleman from Siemens who leads the city's work for Siemens globally. Uh, I have the sustainability director for Land Securities, which is Europe's largest um, commercial developer. Uh, I have um, academics. I have vice president of Imperial College, Professor David Gann. I have uh, Alan Penn, who's the dean of the Bartlett School at UCL. In fact, the founding, there were four founding trustees. I was one of the founding trustees, um, uh, alongside another Kiwi, uh, a guy called Malcolm Grant, who was the provost of UCL at, at the time. Um, the professor who is um, now my research director at the Institute at Metcalfe, who is working for a regional development agency, and uh, a gentleman who has strong links to New Zealand because he's married to a New Zealander, um, Jeremy Watson, Professor Jeremy Watson, who was the, the head of research for Ovarup and Partners Globally. Uh, he now he has been a chief scientist within the UK government, and he's, he now wears a couple of hats. One is he's at uh, University College London, uh, and the other is that he's um, the chief scientist advising the building research establishment, the BRE in the UK, and building innovation. And so a huge Kiwi connection in, in terms of the setup. Actually, the, the other person who was actively involved was Professor Michael Kelly, who I understand was in Wellington yesterday. I had the, the Mayor of Wellington spoke briefly at a, an event I was at yesterday and said she'd just come from a breakfast meeting with Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly um, is... Um, he was a dynamo, I have to say. So he was sitting around the table. At that time, he was one of the chief scientists in the UK government. Our focus in the UK was on, in the built environment, was on new building, delivering um, sustainable new buildings. But the, the basic stat that 80% of the buildings in 2050 uh, in the UK are with us now meant that we needed to be focusing on, on retrofit. And so Mike actually got the institute started. And we, for, for the early years, we focused most of our effort, for the first couple of years at least, on buildings and building retrofit and innovation. So that's that's a long intro. I'm giving you the Kiwi connection. I'm giving you the sense of, I guess, why we exist. And so there was nothing like like us before. Uh, and there are uh, organisations who are starting to take on pieces of what we do, but uh, I don't think there's anyone who's, who's doing exactly the same. Our mission, as it says there, is to significantly accelerate the delivery of sustainable cities and communities. We look at environmental, social and economic as three equal legs. Um, and primarily, we do pilots and demonstration projects. So in terms of engage, engaging, we work with organizations who want to be at the forefront of what they're doing. So we work with uh, big retailers like um, Sainsbury's. And Sainsbury's are looking to drive um, uh, photovoltaics and be the, the largest um, owner uh, and generator of energy from PV in the UK. They're looking at things like their supply chains. They're looking at how you use um, technology for, for moving the goods, freight, telematics, those kinds of things. So we work with people like that. We work with people like Siemens and IBM and others, but we also work with community groups. We work with a lot of um, local authorities and we work with a lot of social landlords. But all of them, in some way, are pushing the boundaries in terms of what their day job is. So we look to work with people who want to push the boundaries in, in what they do. Uh, and we do work very closely with the academic community, so we work with probably 40, 45 different academic institutions um, across Europe. Um, and so the, the two that we work, have the most work with, uh, because we're London-based, uh, University College London and Imperial College. Demonstration. Actually, one of the early things that I learned from um, getting involved in this, so uh, as Philippa said, I'd, when I left New Zealand, I was working f for the Treasury. I arrived in the UK and stumbled into a job in, in an investment bank and then tried to escape a few times, managed to escape after, after 10 years. I had a fantastic time. It was very challenging and interesting, but then I thought it was about time I had um, made some payback. So that's what I've been doing since for the last 10 years. I moved in and helped set up an urban development corporation, which was a Quango public-private body living regeneration, uh, sh short life in East London, an area of severe deprivation, and then that led into the, the setup of the Institute. But w so when I came into this and we were looking at sort of the kinds of things that we would do, actually there were lots of, in fact, the, there were a number of um, quite senior academics and people who've done good stuff who said, oh, we don't focus on rich fit, don't focus on this, actually, because we've done studies and we know what the answers are, and here it is, but what we found is that the business was saying, we've got no idea what we're supposed to be doing, yeah? We, you know, we hear these words and this noise, but we, we need something that we can engage with. So actually, there's um, a huge part of what we've done is focused on three and four that are shown on the screen there, which is making sure that when 
when research has been undertaken, primarily applied research, some of the stuff that we look at, that there's appropriate independent evaluation of that research. But then the last point, dissemination, it's essential that you communicate with people and you talk to people in a way that they, they can engage with and easily engage with. So that while we found that there were lots of interesting projects, many of them actually hadn't been um, evaluated. If they had been evaluated, then you know, there may have been questions over the independence of that evaluation and therefore you know, the ability of people to, to trust it and accept it. But increasingly we found great projects that have been properly um, evaluated and, and, and had some really good things to learn, which were reports which were sitting on a shelf, a virtual shelf or a physical shelf, and it's like, you know, what's the point? So a huge amount of what we've done is around getting stuff out in a format to people who can use it. Now, our focus is not about, uh, at the Institute is about not about helping people live or be more sustainable. It's primarily about driving the people who will deliver sustainability as, as our focus. Okay, so just a couple of slides to give you a flavor of the kinds of things we did. So as I said, so a big, uh, for the first couple of years, a big focus on um, retrofit, so whole system solutions that serve uh, building performance evaluation, um, how you deliver things at scale, looking at su supply chains. So w everything that we've done, we've started by asking the question, you know, where should we be, where are we today, what's stopping us from going, taking the next step and saying, okay, now let's think about how we unlock that. So interestingly, um, I have a dummy's view of, of everything coming from a very different background. I thought, oh, this is going to be about technology. But um, increasingly, it, slowly over time, it became increasingly obvious that this is not about technology. <laughs> Clearly, technology will have a, a, a role to play and a piece to play. But there was an enormous piece in the UK when we were looking at, um, at the retrofit agenda where there was a lack of supply chain. So you could have a big contractor or a big developer saying, yeah, I'm going to build sustainable, but actually... When they tried to go and do it, they couldn't find the people further down their supply chain to be able to deliver it. So we did um, a huge amount on, on that and the skills piece um, of that as well. And the behaviours piece is, is enormous. There's no point giving any of us you know, a technology or a home or, or, or anything if we don't know how to use it in the right way. Right. So helping all of us understand what it is that we should be doing and, how, and why it's to our advantage is essential. So... Increasingly, we've done um, a lot of work, socio-technical work, so looking at um, business models, governance structures, financing models, which is useful for the finance background, but the behaviour change and those kinds of things as well. Okay, so as I said, a lot on supply chain development. We worked with um, across the southeast of England, set up a number of toolkits. And in fact, all the stuff we have is available online. So if anybody's actively working in these areas, you're more than welcome to access this or very welcome to send me an email and we can, we can give you more information. We're really keen to connect and, and to support others um, in the family. One thing we, we're finding ourselves doing increasingly now, which is a relatively simple concept and a light touch in terms of the cost of it, uh, are these things called innovation networks, but they can have enormous impact. And so the, the premise, is, as I said, is pretty simple. The starting point is bring a small number of organ large organizations that want to buy innovation. Yeah? Bring them together. And so we have four of these which are active. We have one with uh, big retailers, one with commercial property owners. We have one with uh, big developers in London, those who are doing the, big, um, the major developments in London. And we have a, a fourth one which is just being set up, which is looking at infrastructure, so utility infrastructure. Bring them together, work with them to articulate what their need is. So that's one of the most important things that we've learned is that even the, the, even the organisations that are at the forefront already will often say, you know, I want to buy this, I want to buy you know, building technology, or I want, I want to buy um, uh, it, it, smart city type tech, whatever it may be. They, they, have, they focus on what they want to buy rather than what they need. So actually we spend quite a bit of time with the, what's the need because actually if you artic articulate the need right, then you can connect to those who may have the solutions. And we often find that people with solutions are not those who you would, you would expect to have the solutions. They could be in a completely different industry. So simple concept, small number of large buyers of innovation, help them articulate what they need, and then connect that with those who have the solutions. And those who have the solutions are quite a broad range, definitely researchers, definitely SMEs and startups and some corporates. But it's also 
other businesses or the public sector who have done things and learned things and, and have lessons that they can then feed into the mix and, and um, for these, these buyers of innovation to figure out what they, what they can do different. Um, I'll skip over that one. It's the infrastructure one as it's coming up. Okay, so that's the Institute for Sustainability. I'll switch hats, put on my climate kick hat. Uh, so as, it, as I said, so why do why focus on climate change? Um, I think that graph which shows you the um, average temperatures, land and ocean temperatures for 2014, um, the, the number of record warmest and much warmer than average, um, it's quite a red screen, so it seems to be obvious from a climate change point of view. The, the climate kick was set up five years ago about the same time as, as the Institute and was set up, as Philippa said, by the European Commission where they set up three kicks, knowledge and innovation communities. And these were a new, new model or new approach to, to bringing new innovation to market. Now, the, the kicks vision is to provide the people, products and leadership to address uh, climate change. But uh, the, the mission on, the, on your right there, to create opportunities for innovators to address the climate change and shape the world's next economy. So this isn't just about the planet's warming up, we have changing climate, we're, you know, we're doomed, you know, how do we save the planet? This really is about saying, how, how can we take this challenge and turn it into something, this problem, and turn it into something positive? And there's huge potential from this to drive the, the next global economy. And so that's a, that is the focus of the climate kick. So the climate kick is a, um, a partnership of 260 partners, um, we have a, a budget this year of um, a 93 million euro, um, but actually the, the real value of the climate kick is not the money because that money is, is tiny in, this, in the scheme of things in terms of how much is being spent uh, in, in climate change, but how much is being spent in research and how much is needed in terms of deliver this. The real value of the climate kick is the diversity of the partners. And the next slide, I think, um, highlights that. But it's really important to understand that, again, so the impact, we're looking for climate impact, definitely, but actually this is economic. So this really is, Europe, I think, is already at the forefront in, in, many, in many areas in terms of climate change innovation and sustainable innovation. We look at climate change and sustainability together because within the climate kick we think systemically as well, which is, which is great. But, but it needs to be societal value too. This can't be something which is done on the side. This has to be something which is done at the core with society for society. Um, so the partnership, there's a, a number of um, uh, nodes across Europe, the 260-odd partners. Um, more than half are from business, a mix pretty much half and half in terms of um, large business and small business. And then um, the academic um, organizations, university and research organizations, and these are um, the, the top um, research organizations in Europe, so uh, people like Imperial College, ETH, Switzerland, uh, TU Delft, TU Berlin, TU Munich, um, the Danish Technical University, lots of, lots of technical, so there's a lot, of, a lot of tech in there. But it's also the public bodies as well. So we have city governments uh, in that. We have not-for-profits as well. So the real value is the bringing together of this really diverse range of organisations who bring something that's really complementary. So when we try and deliver these, these joined up, these tricky, these systemic solutions, then it's fantastic that you can bring people who have the, the completely different components together so you can deliver high-impact projects. And that, that is the... Yes, that's the that's the that's the glue. Kick is the glue. So what's the kick done? So that says in 2014. Though actually, the kick has, uh, as I said, is five years old. We started very small and sort of have built up. It was an experiment in a sense, and it's an experiment that seems to have worked. Uh, we've um, attracted more than 900 million euro in the five years to into climate activities. Quite a broad range of things. Education, entrepreneurship, and innovation are the are the three areas of focus. Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of projects, and then I think I'm I'm going to finish, and we can hopefully have a um, have a conversation. So these are a f uh, there's a handful of very large projects. So one of the things that we decided um, about 18 months back was uh, we were too dispersed. There were lots of interesting and useful things, but actually, even with this quite large community across Europe and a sizable amount of money, there was no way that we could do all this stuff. So we needed to focus on a smaller number of things. 
So um, one of them, one of the key areas that focuses on the reuse of CO2, uh, and there's a, um, a fantastic project, Encore, um, as it's shown here, which is with Bayer, uh, the massive German chemical company, which is looking to take CO2 and turn it into, into rubbers and fibres and foam and stuff that we could use in the real world. Uh, the Low Carbon City Lab is another big one. In fact, this has only just kicked off, and it's a, and it's a range of, um, of the partners who are, I guess, world-leading in terms of measurement. And this is to working with cities who are look, uh, looking at how they can um, measure their performance and, and measure, I mean, a broad range of things that are important to the city, but clearly you know, carbon, CO2, uh, greenhouse gases as well. But it's, it's, it has to be broader than that. It has to be what the city needs to, to function properly. Climate smart agriculture, which I think may have some residents in, in New Zealand. Um, this is not one that I know a lot about, so I'll let you read that for 10 seconds. We'll have a musical break. Um, building Technology Accelerator. One of the, uh, this, is, this is a group of uh, living labs, in fact, there's a big discussion at the, the sensor workshop which at Papa yesterday, which I was at, around uh, Wellington having a number of living labs and trialling things, and that's really important if you can do things in, in the real world. These living labs are a, um, a step closer to the lab, though, than uh, the, the Wellington living labs, insofar as these are, are buildings, so where you take stuff out of, out, of the, um, out of the research labs and actually test them in real buildings, which people are using before actually you go and um, test them in, in the real world. Big focus on buildings, just as they should be. Um, and then I'm going to touch on one last, uh, one of the major projects um, in a second. But the area that I, the Institute for Sustainability and the uh, stuff that we do, and the stuff that we do with the Climate Kick is primarily around city systems. And so I um, uh, lead the thematic area or co-lead the thematic area around sustainable city systems. And that's really... As I said before, the, the whole reason we set up the Institute for Sustainability was to see how you can think about and how you can plan for, how you can invest in, and then how you can manage cities and, I guess, um, subparts of cities in a, in a systemic and a joined up way. And that's the whole focus of the sustainable city systems. And within that, we're focusing on three areas. The, the first is, um, as it says, they're tools for urban design, planning, and management of city systems. So one of the things that we found when we've done neighbourhood and district work was actually it can be pretty obvious to you that looking at um, the buildings, I guess, and things like you know the, the health outcomes is that there's a, a fantastic um, correlation between them. So you could be joining those things up, or biodiversity that has an impact in terms of health as well. And you know, there's lots of things you could join up, but unless you had the, the tools which enabled you to see where the opportunities were from, from the, the interplay between the systems, then it was difficult to um, get people around the table and invest in these things. And um, so quite a bit of work, and actually we were starting from quite a high, high starting point in terms of many of the climate kick partners that had ex a lot of expertise in this. I guess many cities in the world and many of the big tech companies um, are looking at how cities have dashboards so you can manage a city, you know, manage all the different components of them. I have to say, from everything that we've seen, there is still at um, relatively relatively early stage of development these city dashboards. You've, there's a nice IBM one in Rio and a few other places, but most of them are pretty basic in terms of what they do. But the the the, um, the aim is to have some real time information so you can manage things in a joined up way. So that's the first one. The second one is how we look at energy, waste, water, ICT, and mobility in a joined up way, so how you deliver these things, either integrated or understand the interdependencies. And the third area of focus is resource efficiency, so thinking about things in a, in a circular way or a closed loop way. Um, and then just two projects to finish with. So the flagship big project within the Climate Kick, uh, one that we co-lead at the Institute for Sustainability, is called Smart Sustainable Districts. We're working with um, 11 of uh, 11 districts across Europe who are primarily large, very large, and I'm going to touch on the first two we're sort of um, diving into to start with, um, district scale developments. Most of it is new build, there are elements which are retrofitting once they're already, but these are developers, whether they be public or private developers, who had already set a high bar in terms of their sustainability and smart credentials. So they said, we want to be exemplars already. And so we are bringing 
uh, the Climate Kit Partnership to work with them to understand what they've got, what they're planning to do, and then uh, co-develop integrated solutions. So again, the systemic approaches. So it's working with them. And again, many of these people are, who are all well known in, in, I guess, the world of sustainability for doing great stuff, they really struggle with the joining up stuff as well. So that's the core thing. Now, the the measure, our measure of success is factor four, and I didn't know what factor four was until one of my academic friends, academic partners in this project explained it properly to me. It's basically, can we deliver four times the impact for the, for the same price? Impact in terms of climate and carbon, but impact in terms of whatever is important to the district as well. Now, cost savings is a, a huge piece of that, but um, quality of life, health, health impacts, those kinds of things as well. Um, okay, so you can see that we're a little hard, it's a little, but you can see where the, where the districts are. So we have two districts in London, uh, one in Utrecht, one in Rotterdam, one in Paris, one in um, Copenhagen, Berlin, Zurich. So quite a broad range, very different challenges they have. I'll just go very quickly touch on two. One is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, so we're, which is um, not too far from where we're based. Actually, in, um, Huge amount of investment went in for, for games time, but there's an enormous amount of development coming post games now as well. So the the area was a um, like a Mad Max wasteland, I have to say, uh, where the where the main Olympic Park is now. You know, such levels of pollution that there were you know, very low grade um, low grade industry, if there was industry, if you could call it that. There were parts that you would you wouldn't want to drive a fancy car through. I put it that way. But there, and then around that, there's lots, you know, some of the most deprived parts of, of the UK as well. And so it really was an area in need of, um, of um, investment and development. So the Games is fantastic, but for most of us in that area, this is not about the Games. This is about the legacy of the Games. And the, the, the Legacy Development Corporation, which is a Merrill Development Corporation, which is, is the primary reason why we're working there, because they have a long-term vision. And their vision is to develop a pioneering model of urban regeneration, sustainable infrastructure for sustainable lifestyles. So they're really keen to use this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to test and trial things, to deliver real value for people who need it in, in East London, but actually to, to, to connect to others around the world who are doing things that we can learn and we can take it in and we can trial it here, but also we can feed back to people as well. Now, this is a busy slide because this is one I um, put together for the... Um, the census workshop yesterday, which had a lot more stuff, I guess, on the smart side of things, which was the focus. But here are the four focus areas for the work we're doing with the guys in the Olympic Park. So starting with the venues and buildings, looking at whole energy systems. Interestingly, this is not just technology-based. They have um, strong interest in ownership models for renewable energy, for example, and thinking about community ownership. Big programs on behavior change, the so programs on actually how you get people in, in, engaged. Actually, there's um, quite a bit of stuff on the smart park side of things um, around, so you can see the second bullet point there says engage and connect people. So the, when, you, when you look at sustainability and you look at smart, actually we have a fantastic opportunity with the, the data and digital revolution to be able to connect with people and have a dialogue with people in a way we never could before. So a big focus is on how do you engage people, how do you create a sense of community, and that's a, a big part of the focus here. And underpinning that is is data and the the data piece. In London, the, the mayor's office has set something up um, uh, called the London Data Store, which they've put the infrastructure in for and then piled in um, hundreds of public data sets, so the, the traffic buildings, all sorts of stuff. And increasingly now they suddenly put private data sets in and they make that available for those who develop um, apps, APIs and the rest. And so you let the creative community come and you give them the tools so that they can do the innovation and come back with solutions. What we're going to do with the Olympic Park is we're going to set up a little subset of that where we're going to trial wacky, wacky things, interesting things, how, how we um, capture, uh, I guess, data from social media for people who are coming to the park and in the park, um, how we uh, engage with people in this sort of things, so engage with people and have... You know, interaction with um, with buildings and with um, inanimate objects and those kinds of things. So you get to learn about what, what's in the park. You can feed back as well, and your story can become part of it. Very quickly, because um, I know I've probably been talking for too long. So the second area, the um, Smart Sustainable District, is in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, which is a, a quite a different focus. It's a major um, transportation hub. There's quite a bit which is um, a retrofit that's 
transport at the core, um, but their focus is similar as well. So we these 11 districts we've identified and the two we've started with now, we started with a very long list of districts who wanted to come and, um, and play. Uh, and we prioritized down primarily around those that offered the greatest opportunity to, to innovate and trial new things. And that was partly based on what they're doing already, but it's partly based on their openness to collaborate and their willingness to collaborate. Okay, last project is um, a project which we run at the Institute of Sustainability. We call it Total Community Retrofit or Neighborhood Demonstrators, and that's the, the little um, fly-through we had before. It was a um, short video we put together with uh, our partners in the Technical University of Munich who've done the, the 3D modeling of, of the area. They'd originally done a 3D model of all the property in Berlin. So you got a sense, so you could see the buildings, but they put into that the relative energy efficiency of all the buildings and, and things like the potential for renewable energy, whether it be you know, solar or heat pumps or whatever, or whatever it may be, and they were overlaying things. So we said to them, that's, that's great. We'd love you to come to East London. We've got this project. We like the physical, we like the building stuff and some of the, the utility infrastructure stuff we could put in as well, but we want to overlay the social and the economic stuff. So we're working with the social landlords. We're putting in you know, where there's fuel poverty. We're putting in where there's unemployment. We're putting in actually where... There are rent arrears where you know where tenants aren't able to pay their rent. So when you start to get all these different layers building up, you can start to see patterns and you can start to understand where you should be investing and what you could be doing to, to solve these problems rather than picking off everything in isolation. So the purpose of this was how could we deliver as much of what makes up a sustainable community as possible in one place? We picked our neighbourhood in East London in, in an area in Tower Hamlets called Bromley by Bow and Poplar, which is just south of the Olympic Park. It's a large neighbourhood, it's 50,000 people, so it's quite, it's, it's big. Talking to people in Christchurch about this, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, I guess Christchurch is a neighbourhood then. Um, and then the, the thing here, again, comes back to the, the socio-technical, the, the, the non-physical stuff. The most, import, the most important things, or I guess the two most important things, were first was, was community-owned change. It was essential that this was something that was owned by the community and the community had a voice. We understood who was there, what networks they had, and how they were represented as a community, and this was something that they owned and co-owned in the development of it. The second thing that was really important was, actually it wasn't about the technologies we would use, it was about the governance structures and the legal structures that enabled people to come and be able to work with each other. So the council to be able to work with the community group, to be able to work with the business, to be able to work with the academics. The, providing the framework, the governance, was far and away the most important thing because once you did that, then people could find their own opportunities for collaboration and doing things and things would happen. Okay, um, there's, a, there's an image of the, of, the, of the part of the model that they looked at. So, so some of the projects, uh, just to finish, so there were a number of green programs they, because um, greening and community gardens and those kinds of things were um, a huge priority locally, but also thinking about how we moved further assets, whether they be um, buildings or whether they be space, or whatever they may be, into community ownership where that made sense. Um, closed loop communities was a, uh, well still is actually a major project there which is looking at how do we draw a boundary around this, this uh, neighbourhood and not let waste leave until we've extracted as much uh, value locally. And so we looked at um, food and uh, bulky waste and the waste electronics. Uh, and we set up the UK's first uh, electric vehicle car club um, in, a, in an area of, of deprivation. I think it may have been the first EV car club full stop. And again, this was a business model thing rather than just having a technology because we had to get the, the vehicles was one thing, that's fine, but you needed the, the company that kind of had the business model on top and then we needed to get the council and the landlords to, to commit. So, for example, one of the social landlords had a scheme whereby any new tenant would come in, and these guys have, I don't know, they've got like 10,000 dwellings, so they're quite large. So any new tenant would come in, would get 12 months free membership of the, of the electric vehicle car club, because one of the, the reasons for doing this in this area was because there was um, um, transport poverty. There was a lot of fuel poverty, but I hadn't heard of transport poverty. But what that meant was that people were wasting an enormous amount of money because they couldn't get to shops where things were cheaper, so they were buying everything locally in, uh, in places which were much more expensive. So transport poverty was a priority. Home energy management systems, a lot of stuff in buildings as well. And I think that's probably enough. So thank you very much. Thank you.